Welcome to the March edition of Washington Watch. Uh, today's guest is a very dear friend of mine, and not only is he a friend of mine, he's a friend of the American people, and I'll explain that in just a moment. But it's Congressman Ron Paul from the 14th District of Texas. Uh, Dr. Paul enjoys a national reputation as a leading spokesman for limited government, uh, lower taxes, free markets, and a return to sound monetary policies based on commodity-backed currency. Uh, he serves on the House Financial Service Committee, uh, the International Relations Committee, as well as the Joint Economic Committee. In 1988, Dr. Paul was the Libertarian Party's candidate for the United States presidency. Most recently, he was a Republican uh, candidate for the presidency in the year 2008. I've met his lovely wife, and she is a very lovely person, Carol. They reside in uh, Lake Jackson, Texas and they're proud parents of five children and 17 grandchildren. Uh, Dr. Ron Paul, thank you for being on the show today. Good to be with you, Walter. I remember the last time you were on, it was right before uh, you officially announced, but you had announced that you were going to be a candidate for the presidency on the Republican Party. And uh, Ron, I want to tell you that you have a lot of supporters in the 3rd District of North Carolina. Um, many times during the campaign when you were with other candidates and y'all were having the debates and the forums and everything. Uh, I had numerous people that stopped and asked me if I knew you, and I said he's one of, one of my best friends in Congress, and he's a man that I have learned a great deal from, a uh, member of the Liberty Caucus. And uh, today, uh, I want to have you speak about the fact, going back to the bailout, but even in the last two weeks, uh, the United States government has spent $1.2 trillion on programs. I'm just going to give you for the uh, next few minutes an opportunity to, to tell the people of the 3rd District uh, why you and I have voted, uh, we were opposed to the bailout, why we voted against the stimulus package, and how this is going to impact the economy and the monetary policy of this country. Well, very simply, and I, I know you've heard me say this before, we got into trouble because we have spent too much money, our deficits are too high, and then we resort to printing money, which is the inflation. And we've been doing this for not a year or two, but for a decade or two, and finally that financial bubble has burst. So what are the leaders of our country saying, both congressional and the uh, executive branch leadership, even in the previous administration and the previous Congress? That is, that we need to spend more money, run up a bigger deficit, and print more money. It's absolutely makes no sense and yet we're doing exactly the thing that got us into trouble and we think that's going to get us out of it. I use the example of 1921 uh, as what we should do. There was a recession depression at that time because of the consequence of the inflation to pay for the bills for World War I right. and that's expected. So that, uh, that lasted for one year because back then they didn't think the government should solve all the problems and they liquidated the debt and the malinvestment disappeared. In the 30s, both Hoover and Roosevelt did exactly the opposite. That depression didn't end until the end of World War II. That's when we got back on our feet again. So uh, if you recognize the cause, you certainly wouldn't pursue those same policies. And that is why I argue the strong case for fiscal restraint. Dr. Paul, uh, during the discussion and debate about the bailout of Wall Street, uh, I had numerous people in my district, uh, hard-working people, some middle-aged, some young with small children that I would see in the grocery store or other parts, uh, places in my district, and they kept asking me, and I actually asked this um, to Mr. Bernanke. I said, uh, Mr. Bernanke, um, where are my people want to know, the people ask me, where are we getting the money? I said, are we going to print the money? And I think his answer was something. No, we could just borrow the money from central banks or something. <laughs> uh, I wish you would touch on the fact that the, a nation that has to go to other governments to pay its bills, I don't know. You're the expert. <laughs> I don't know how it survives. But yeah, so well, we do borrow a lot from overseas, and that is part of the problem. And we've, since this crisis broke, we have appropriated a lot of money, you know, even even early last year that was the first 100 billion dollar package and then there was the TARP funds and then there's been a subsequent another bailout package and that has, adds up into the hundreds of billions of dollars and that's huge uh, but we also have another problem what the Fed does secretly 
But the money that we're spending in running up these deficits, in the last 12 months, our national debt went up $1.5 trillion. That's historic highs. So we can tax people to pay these bills, but who's left to tax? Even the Democrats are having trouble figuring out who they're going to tax next. So that's not an easy option. The second thing is they can borrow money, and they still borrow a lot, and we're, the foreigners are still loaning us money, but that will eventually end because uh, there's, there's a limit to that. A lot of this is just then financed by the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve monetizes the debt. They can create money with a computer. If there's a Treasury bill floating out there, if there's $10 billion worth of debt out there and nobody wants it, the Fed can buy it with nothing. All they do is create credit automatically with, with a computer and they, and they buy that. But what really bothers me the most is not all this all the spending everything is bad and getting in this right. trouble was a mess it's the fact that the fed can extend credit and buy up assets on the qt they're doing that and if you add up what the congress has done plus what the fed has done the obligation now is 9.3 trillion dollars and quite a few of those trillions matter of fact most of that has come from the fed and of course uh we're not allowed to find out exactly what the fed is doing we have enough trouble figuring out what the treasury is doing let alone the fed uh today i believe that um you will soon be introducing legislation uh, on the floor you asked me and all the members both republican and democrat to join you in this legislation uh dealing with the federal reserve would you maybe explain well, that to the uh, viewers because you will be introducing this soon i think yeah well matter of fact i did get a chance after we talked okay. and i appreciate your support on this bill but I, I am not the kind to be overly aggressive and go out and get the names and sign up and, and do the legwork that I should do. But while we were sitting there, it was rather, uh, rather amazing. Uh, yeah. You and I were talking, and, and before I knew it, I had 12 signatures on, which is pretty good <laughs> when I didn't even get off my chair. That's right. <laughs> and we had, what, three, maybe about five Democrats came over, yeah. which tells me it's a ripe issue. And what it is, it's... Uh, uh, a Federal Reserve Transparency Act. Right. In the code, it said the uh, GAO has an obligation to audit the Fed, except for A, B, C, D, which is everything. So under the law, we're not even allowed to get any answers from the Federal Reserve. So this isn't dealing with returning to the gold standard and then right. these major moves. This is just saying, do we have a right to know? And this is ripe. And the fact that we were it getting is. signatures like that, and just common sense would tell almost any member of Congress to say, you know, can you imagine somebody going home and say, oh yeah, there's a bill that says that Congress has a right to know what the Fed's doing. Oh no, I don't think we have a right. <laughs> I so I think I'm getting energized over this. No, and I think we can get a lot of support. I, I, I know you can because at, at the time of the, this country's history, Today, I think there's more distrust than I've seen in a long time of of government, and and uh, particularly up here in Washington because of, as you may mention, the the, the previous administration and this administration uh, seem to be out of touch with the American people. Uh, they really do, and and the fact that this the Federal Reserve has so much power and influence, yeah. and yet members of Congress, the American people, can't ask them a question. It's crazy. I think I could make the case for saying that the chairman of the Federal Reserve Board is more powerful than our president. When you think he can control trillions of dollars without appropriation, he's certainly more powerful than the Congress. We, you know, we're over there. <laughs> we, we think we're important voting on an $800 billion package, but he can <laughs> go and create $3 trillion and not even tell us. So, no, there's good reason for distrust. And in a way, it's a blessing in disguise that, that this system isn't working so well because it's calling attention to it. And you're right, we've lost credibility. We've lost credibility in our party yes, we as are. well as the whole Congress. People are frightened and scared. That's right. To me, the key is, is coming up with the right ideas and the right understanding because people too often, when they're, when they're frightened, they do the wrong things. You know, after 9-11, people were frightened and they were willing to vote and do some things rather rapidly. They do it in foreign policy. They do it, like right now, spend and inflate. And, and we have to come up with sound ideas. I don't think, I don't think it is a party thing. I, I think if I there's either. a true revolutionary change, 
uh, the right ideas would become pervasive and go into both parties, just as I think the bad ideas got into both parties. Because I don't like Keynesian economics, because I think that leads towards socialism. But both right. parties uh, are Keynesian in, mm -hmm. in the fact that they believe the economy should be planned, that you can print money, deficits don't matter. If the economy gets in trouble, you have more deficits than the government spends more money. Totally contradicts all free market principles.